Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly podcast. We're still not quite over England's Hyderabad win just yet, so we go again today. I'm Yaz Rana and with me are Phil Walker, Katia Whitney and Jim Wallace. Um, none of this lot were on Sunday's show, so we're going to spend quite a good chunk of this episode just reliving that test again, because why the hell not? Um, today's trivia question, for which I'll re- reveal the answer, or the answers at the end of the show, is... Drum roll, please. 21 English test batsmen have scored a 1,000 runs or more from number three. Ollie Pope is one of them and averages 49. He is seventh on the list when you rank them by average. Who are the six guys ahead of him? Huge. Right, hold on. Let me make a note. You're not, you're not <laughs> looking it up now, shout, are you? Are we just going <laughs> to shout these out to you throughout the um, duration? I think I think it's more you mull it over in the back of your mind for a week. If you if you if no not for a week, I'll reveal the the answers <laughs> at the end of the episode. For a week. Um, so if there are any periods where your mind's drifting away, that's something to sort of anchor your brain to. Got you. Um, anyway, um, Katya, I was thinking the other day that as good as the twenty three Ashes were, we were sort of actually starved of England men's Test cricket last year. In that the men only really played two months out of eleven. And this was just the absolute perfect reminder for all of us as to how good and how watchable this side is. Yeah, it does feel like a, a long time, that Ashes series. It does feel like a long time ago. And when I was looking up stuff, comparing it to the to the Pakistan series, I forgot that was in 2022 mm. and we're now in 2024. So it's actually been a, a long time since that series. And, and obviously with that win, it's had kind of similar vibes to it. Um, how were you following it? What were you doing? <laughs> well, the Pakistan or this one? This one. I was up at four in the morning, every, every morning. Super. Not every work. morning. Every morning, apart from the last one, when I was in bed still by the time of the end of the test. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a, it was, it, you know, it actually, even working the days that England were bad or, or were the worst days for England wasn't, didn't feel like that bad because it was still pretty watchable. So mm. it didn't, it didn't kind of feel like the drag of India tours that we've had in the past of setting your alarms, getting up, because it was still so watchable. Mm. I don't know if you found that because you were on the, the earlies as well. No, no, definitely. I, I thought every, every session was, was really engaging and there was always, because England are doing things slightly differently, have done weird things in terms of selection, etc. It was always very watchable. Um, Jim, how much did you enjoy it? Uh, yeah, very much so. Particularly the, um, the the last day I thought was incredible with the, with the whole subplot of what was happening out in yeah. Australia at the same time. It felt like a real moment. Um, I, I, I don't mind the, the, I quite like, there's something quite nice about that graveyard shift. Uh, I've always quite liked, even when I was a kid, tuning into overseas tours like under the pillow with the radio and, and that sort of thing. So I, I, I quite like it. I quite like that you feel like part of a secret little club that's um, sort of these weird people that are up in the wee small hours following this mad game. But uh, yeah, it was, it was really, really, really good fun. Hmm. Um, on, on the cricket itself, Phil, we've seen some um, incomprehensible turnarounds from England under Stokes. Um, this has widely been described as, as this side's greatest achievement. I thought on Stokes himself, this was the best illustration just yet of, of his the, the wideness of his skill set as captain and how he impacts games um, himself in terms of what he does, but also how he impacts individuals. Well, yeah, so three... England debutante slow bowlers and they, they take a, a five bag on debut. That doesn't happen by accident. We've been saying it about him before, but the way that he foregrounds players in at peculiar moments in the game is a mark of a captain with complete control of his of his of his environment and of the landscape as well. And it's no time for false modesty when you've pulled off a heist like that. But when he he was interviewed afterwards and he says, Well, I'm quite a quite a good observer of the game actually. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed or not. He didn't say that. He said he said I'm actually a great observer. Sorry, of the yeah, game. I was bit, I was <laughs> I was trying to dial it down a little bit. But what's the point? What's the point in dialing it down? Um, like all the great leaders and all, all the great sports people, really, it all bends to their will. And 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 Stokes has this mad alchemy of it, absolute unimpeachable confidence in his own ability because he's he's an all time great. Uh, and this kind of empathy as well, this sort of sixth sense for what the players beneath him require at that particular moment. It must be, I mean, people will write books about this. You know, people already have. Well, yeah. They were on a couple <laughs> of weeks ago. But they will write books about what it is to play under mm. Stokes. And they'll, they'll write books about what it is to just be in his orbit. Uh, and players will write their own autobiographies in, in time to come. And 
And there'll be a chapter just on him, just on him as, as a captain. I've never seen an on-field captain quite like him before. Mm. Uh, I've seen lots of captains where I can just about understand what they're doing. Um, and I've seen some captains, we've all seen some captains where you, you, you're you kind of on their wavelength. They're a bit ahead of you, but he creates things out of nothing. And you saw that in particular on that final day where India seemed mentally shot, really. And they went into their shells. And again, if it, I think if they were to to start from scratch that fourth innings, they'd go about it in a different way. I thought Rohit was the only player who showed the way mm. um, and was prepared to live a little, recognising that if you hang around, there's, there's going to be one with your name on it and mm. all the rest of it. But, but the way that Stokes orchestrated the show with complete and utter control, uh, you, can't, you can't teach that. Yeah. Uh, and it comes from that sort of reservoir of self-belief that he has, born out, day after day, year after year, being basically the most complete cricketer on the planet. We know how much you, you love your stats. There were a couple of stats earlier today you said that sort of illustrated just that in terms of how much England were, were reverse sweeping versus India, how yeah. much England were attacking and all that. So, I mean, this was a Crick Info stat. It might have been a Crick Viz stat, but I, saw, I read it on Crick Info. Um, and it, it goes to show the difference in, in courage, really, between the two teams and also the difference in fundamental technique against spin, but crucially, the method that England have now adopted. Uh, England attempted 54 reverse sweeps. Now, half of them would have come off Ollie Pope's bat, but they attempted 54 reverse sweeps and took 84 runs from it. And catcher, we were saying, can't remember a wicket to a reverse sweep, right? So 20 wickets fell, None to the reverse sweep. 84 runs were, were taken from 54 attempts. India, 12 attempts, nine runs, of which I think Rohit was responsible for eight of them because he reverse swept mm. two in and over before he got out in the next. Now, India don't need to reverse sweep, or rather, crucially, they haven't needed to reverse mm. sweep or do anything outside of the box because they have superior techniques against the turning ball to everybody else. Just as the whole... Stokesian philosophy has been about finding a way to, if you like, overcome your the the limits of your ability as a consequence of your system, right? So we don't have quick bowlers. <laughs> so we go out to India to Pakistan on flat ones without any proper proper quicks apart from Mark Wood. So what do we do? We find a way. Go out to India with in inverted commas inferior spinners or certainly less experienced spinners to India's three greats. What do you do? You find a way. And the way that they decided they were going to do it, they were going to reverse sweep till their hands bled all over the pitch. And you saw it from Duckett. You saw it from Pope. You saw it from others as well. Um, and it spooked India. Mm. The fascinating thing is what happens next. Do India still believe that their way is the way and that India, England will come unstuck? Do they commit to their bit or do they think, okay, well, perhaps what we saw from Rowett in that half an hour before he got out, perhaps there needs to be a little bit more adventure if, if when the game comes down the mm. pipe. It would be I think absolutely yeah. fascinating to see. It depends on conditions. The conditions change so much in India. And the state of the game, uh, but, but as in, you know, I'd, I'd still say that India got their approach against uh, on, on, a, on a flat wicket in the first innings pr pretty much right. Um, they probably left runs out there in terms of may maybe looking for boundaries that weren't there at times. But it's, I guess the question is, what do they do on pitches that, that really, really turn? I actually think they're going to be changes to the India team for the, for the for the second test. And you've got two big names in Rahul and Jadeja who won't be there. I actually think that if these two inexperienced guys come in, the way they have scored their runs recently, I actually don't think it's the worst thing in the world that they've got two guys in there who, who, who have, have a bit more of a go. Um, because it, because that would be something to challenge England, and England weren't really challenged in that way in that fourth innings. Um, yeah, I can I can hear that. Uh, that said, the two players that they've lost are their two form players, and they seem to have the best option certainly in that first innings against what England were throwing at them. To lose Raúl, albeit it might only just be for that that one Test match, but. To lose him when he's in that perfect little purple patch. He's made a brilliant 100 in this South Africa. He played brilliant in the first innings. To lose him is a, is a big one. But to lose your number six, world-class all-rounder, 
whose record is only beginning to creep up on people to put him in that top bracket, uh, or certainly knocking on the door of that that top that top room. Um, they are big, big, big losses. And mm. it's funny looking at it from the English perspective. Mad as it is to say this, a week on <laughs> from where every, most people were, like this time last week, they go into that test with obviously a, a bit of pep. But this is their best chance to actually put put down a genuine marker to potentially mm. win the series. Mm. So you feel if it goes one one with the big, the giants coming back in Coley yeah, quite and a few of them. Shammy, probably. Kaya will be back. Jadej is going to play again in the mm. series. Um, then it becomes harder and harder for England. But my God, if they go up two up, and this is this is their moment, their moment, right? They're, mm. they're not going to get a better chance than than right here and now. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think when you were talking about like the England pep and stuff like that, if you think about where we were a week ago, we were having all these um, quotes coming out from Ben Ben folk, um, Ben Duckett. Um, there's too many Bens. Um, saying that, oh, you know, I've got 10, 10 different sweep shots that I'm going to play and all that kind of stuff. And you can hear the bravado and the brashness come out in them. But behind that, it's easy to forget that they, ha they have actually thought it through. Like there is a defined approach to it and it did work in this test match. And, you know, basketball is so much about bravado and building into your own hype and that kind of stuff. And, and Joe Root saying Ollie Pope's one of the best innings he's ever seen, that kind of thing, bigging them all up. But there is a thought process behind it. It's not a kind of traditional thought process but ollie robinson telling us about how they prepared that actually looking behind that there is an actual method to that the, the way they've gone about that they get a lot of stick for, for playing too much golf and in a lot of cases rightly so but there is um a defined thought process behind it and it's easy to forget with all that kind of brashness to totally it. that D duck it's a good little example actually because he gets a, a good 30 odd in the first inning basically a runner ball and then prods forward a bit half-heartedly it gets trapped on the crease. And again, if you got down on one knee and just flat batted it either side, it'd have probably got something on that and it would have run away for runs. Second innings, you didn't see him do that shot. You didn't see him just prod tentatively, timidly waiting for mm. it to turn and then reacting. He just went after it. And all right, it came unstuck against the reverse swing of, of Bumrah. But nonetheless, he'd already made, he'd, he'd kind of become more committed mm to his way. Yeah, and I don't think and you can... And this is what they're doing, you know? And I, and, I don't think, player. and I don't think you can overlook the contributions from Duckett and Crawley up top. Not a significant score between them in this test match, but just we, we are now, at this point in time, it feels quite a long time ago that we're having discussions over, mm. you know, what should happen up top. And England have, have got to lot, lots of really steady starts, maybe not huge, huge opening partnerships. Yeah. But, but, but they, they provide a platform. They make, make sure that, you know, Pope doesn't have to face Boomer with a brand new ball, yeah. for example. Yeah, they get off to a to a bit of a flyer. Uh, they might not go on and get 150 for none, but they often get to 50. I think they've got quite mm. a few little 40 and 50 partnerships. I was just going to add that um, quite a worry for India is that the two guys that did it in this test for England, the two big turnarounds, so Pope looked really skittish and, and not really at the races in the first innings, and everyone was sort of saying, oh, his, his techniques against spin is, mm. is still a bit all over the shop. He then plays an all-time great overseas test match innings for England. And Hartley, who's the debutant that gets a load of tap, then gets seven for in the second inning. So it's actually two blokes that haven't been involved in the whole basball thing for the past however long it's mm. been going, two years. Um, so the Roots and the Stokes, uh, Anderson is going to come in. You know, th there's still all these big name players that can still win a test match for mm. England still to come. So really, it was quite refreshing that it was, um, you know, two guys that haven't been involved in this process that that basically won the game for England. Yeah, just, just on on the on the Duckett Crawley partnership. So they average a tick over fifty now, um, and you know it's a, it's a still a smallish sample size, and challenges will will come around, no doubt. Uh, but that is surprising because there was a feeling that it was going to be a very up and down mercurial kind of partnership, but they've actually been pretty consistent, um, and that they do complement each other and they feed off each other quite well. We saw it at the Oval in the final Test match where. They took that game away from Australia and and you know, they put on a hundred across the two innings in this test match. I think 110 actually in this in this test match. Um so they average 50. Comparison for English fans, Cook and Strauss averaged 40 and a half. Cook and Strauss are held up as the partnership of our times for England. Strauss and Truscothic average 55. Um 
so they're between those two, but le- le- leaning towards the top, top, top there. Um, all right, Hobbs and Sutcliffe averaged 90 <laughs> odd, 93, but that's from a different world. Uh, that's the big thing. And you were saying this rightly a few weeks ago. England's top three will help to dictate how much England can stay in this series. Well, we've seen what they can do when mm. they do have that kind of platform. Mm. Um, Katia Oli asks, if, and it's a big if, England go on to win this, is this the greatest achievement in the history of English Test cricket? This Indian team is much stronger than 2012 and the Aussie team of 10-11. And also, do you think Ben Stokes will turn down the inevitable knighthood? That's a big question. <laughs> Several big questions in there. Um, well, it's going to be up there, isn't it? Like, I I think if England go realistically to, to win this series, they need to win the next test. That's what we're saying, right? Pretty much. I, God knows. I mean, yeah. Christ, okay. it, it gets if this was a normal a team, if this was a normal team, I'd say yeah. I, I, with this lot, I've, I've given up predicting. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think it's hard to keep them at, to keep India at bay, knowing what's to come and knowing how strong they should be, barring more injuries towards the end of the series. But all predictions are, you know, fools' errands when yeah. it comes to this lot. But that's the point, isn't it? So if if they win the next two and then win one of the next three, there'll always be the caveats of like no Cody in those first two Test matches, no Rahani, no Jadeja, no Shami, all that lot. So it will be big, but I think the bigger achievement would be if they then actually lost the next Test and then came back from it. Obviously, <laughs> no, definitely. Mm. But you know that kind mm. of thing. Mm. Yeah, um, just sort of. It's right up there, though. Yeah, definitely. It is um, right up there. Just sort of imagining what this year could look like, right? For, for England. England have 17 tests this year, including the one that's just happened. Um, it is not inconceivable that by the end of the year, Ben Stokes will have the most test wins as England captain. If England win uh, another 40, 14 out of the next 16 tests, which I know sounds mad. But, You're setting yourself up for a fall <laughs> but, here, Chief. But I'm just, I'm just putting it out there. It is possible that, that, that Stokes draws level or even His win percentage is quite high already right he's, it's, he's it's second only to NASA is he no no no, no. He's, no? he's second to Steve Waugh in the history of the game for England no so for, so for percentage I think he's he's either top or I think Jardine might be top okay uh, but is, is that sort of yeah, yeah he's, he's, um, he's won as many games or he might have gone past Atherton but I think he's Hussein is two or three yeah, yeah ahead of him yet but percentage wise yeah I mean Stokes is way ahead miles ahead yeah oceans uh, ahead um we should talk about Hartley a bit more, I think. Um, we were talking yesterday, uh, the other day, about giving giving Key and Bobat credit for you know identifying this guy and being brave enough to decide to go in on someone like Hartley who's not played much first-class cricket at all. But I guess it's not really possible to pick those players and and, and expect them to thrive if it weren't for the, for the leadership of Stokes. Because we've seen you know one of the traits of English cricket in the last... 10, 15 years, is, and, and maybe even longer, is, is real mismanagement of, of spin bowling talent. And here you can see what Stokes' management was able to produce. I think that's a really, to be a fly on the wall in the dressing room between days one and four would be would be a little um, novella in itself, really, the turnaround. Because here's a guy who was absolutely mauled. People were saying his name along with Simon Kerrigan, with, with the Watson thing in, in the Yips in 2013. Um and you know it was real low. He could have very much been a one-hit wonder, and and you know and faded away. And you said you know well it was an experiment that it went wrong, a bit like the Jason Moore experiment went wrong or whatever. You hold your hands up, but then he comes round within three days to win the Test match, and by the end he's so confident. You know he's fist pumping and doing and spinning them past the edge and taking the top yeah. of off stump. Uh, it is remarkable, and Stokes does have this track record of doing it with young spinners. So he did it with Rahan and, and Will Jacks, who both got fivers. Um, so he, he does. He 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 gives them com- even when the, the odds are against and they're getting tapped. He was going for reviews, right? Which were to to the viewer at home. They're like, "Why is he reviewing that? That's clearly not out." But mm. he's trying to give them some confidence. He's trying to pump up the tires. He's mm. trying to make them feel like they're in the game, which which must play a play a part. And you could think that other captains probably a guy has a shocker like that on day one probably ignored. You know, a bit a bit of a sort of a cloud over them, and they don't come back from that. So. Obviously, Stokes takes a lot of credit. Hartley must take a lot of credit for being able to dust himself down and come back and, and perform in that way, really. He's obviously made of, of strong northern stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, in, interesting route, not just into the international team, but in domestic cricket as well. Jim, you were telling me earlier today that he was still working for the family business 
uh, in his spare time this winter. Yeah, November. Um, and obviously, and, and still played a lot of club cricket uh, two years ago for his, yeah. his club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and uh, I just saw a piece this morning. I think it was um, Tim Wigmore had done an interview with his dad. His dad's got a it was an Olympic hurdler, uh, hurdler, four hundred meter. And it was a lovely piece with his dad. Got hold of his dad, and his dad was saying how nervous he was watching it. And after the first day, you know, they were all sort of in bits, and the and the local club were watching it, and and they were sort of exchanging really worried messages, but. Um, and then, and then the turnaround. But yeah, his dad was saying that they have a family garden center in Ormskirk in Merseyside. And as recently as November, Tom was bedding plants and doing some shifts to sort of um, keep him ticking over. So he's gone from that mm. only a couple of months ago to, to pretty much single-handedly bowling England to a remarkable victory in India. It's, it's and, he, and, he knows how to, and he knows how to celebrate as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The video of him. Uh, what's the song? I can't remember the song. Uh, it's I Whitney, isn't it? Yeah, it's Whitney Houston. Whitney. I want to dance with somebody. Um, <laughs> um, he only spoke to us for 20 odd minutes, but it was three days before he was packing his bags to head out to that Abu Dhabi prep time. And he was genuinely impressive, right? And Sorry, can I, can I ask you about that, actually? Because I thought in the interview um, on TV, I'd never, never heard him speak at length before. And I thought this sort of makes sense, actually, in terms of he seemed, obviously, how Stokes managed him on day one helped. But he seemed to be someone who's self-assured enough to realise you're going to get hit for six. He was, he, was, he was self-assured enough to know that, actually, I didn't actually bowl that badly on day one. That's going to happen. Yeah. He's obviously someone who's brought up in white ball cricket. And also, he fields very well. He bats very well for, for, a, for a low-order player. And I don't know how, how to quite say this. This is quite a goofy England team in many ways. You know, a lot of players who really need their tyres to be pumped up. He comes across as someone yeah. who... He's relatively independent, I think. You know, he's had to well, get to where I, he is. I, I said a... to him, tongue in cheek, so Coley, Gill, Rowett, you fancy that then? And he said, well, it sounds weird, but I've been bowling the Liverpool leagues from, from a very early age and they all come at you all the time. <laughs> and he said, no, I bowl white ball cricket. And so they're always coming at me. doesn't matter who you are. They're always coming at me. And he wasn't trying to be disrespectful to three great players, obviously, but he was saying that, that's been his experience as a slow bowler. And so while he's inexperienced numbers wise, he's quite experienced uh, in terms of what he's actually gone through. <laughs> and also I think there is an element, you know, if you are born into a sporting high performance family, then you're kind of sort of Im imbued in you, I think. Got some metal. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think yeah. so. It's an interesting comparison with Leach because there's a guy who uh, hasn't done a lot of white ball bowling and, and mm. people used to say when, remember when Pant took him to town um, in the last series and I think he did a few interviews saying he's not used to quite having people come at him quite so hard. Um, and he's a guy that's played an awful lot of cricket, first class cricket before, before he got selected, whereas Hartley hasn't had that grounding in the professional game, but he's played a lot of club cricket and, and had that sort of hard upbringing in the game. And, and so, and maybe that's a, a mindset shift as well, that he doesn't mind, you know, Stokes doesn't mind going for runs. They don't panic. But yeah, um, that's it. It's, yeah, just, he, he, he Jack, said, sorry, just on that, Jack Leach has played two T20 games. Yeah. Tom Hartley, eight years younger than him, has played 82. Yes. He, he, said, he said to us, if you, if you want to bowl something, then you bowl it. And as long as you own it and commit to it, then it's going to come off and there'll be no one telling you off for expressing yourself. Mm. Uh, and then I asked him about the Karen ball and he said, yeah, well, you know, from what I hear of Stokes, it'll be all right and I'll, I'll spit one out for you. <laughs> and and it was all very much out the side of the mouth, but it still goes to something that you would it would have been very hard to imagine, say, I don't know, to pl pluck a name out, Scott Borthwick saying that before an Ashes tour or Mason Crane. Mm. or Simon Kerrigan, or any number of sort of pluckish, best of luck, young English spinners doing a madly difficult thing on pitches that don't give you anything. But he had already seemed like he'd absorbed himself into the, into the, the you know, the nature of what it is to play in under, under, under this bloke. He, he also for this, for this team. completely changed what he did between innings. In the first innings, he, he bowled really quite quickly, quite flat. I know the conditions were very different, but he, he did something completely different to what he yeah. tried to do in the first innings. So to sort of identify that and pull it off is we we, we very did impressive. we did say that in our otherwise car crash day two um, <laughs> daily pod. My my word, there's a lot those daily pods and come back to haunt you. But we we did say that that with a bit more confidence he will 
relax in, the body will relax, the fingers will relax. He was bowling kind of one track style, dr- you know, driving it into the pitch, thinking that that's the only way to do it in India. And not mm. perhaps the moment got to him a, a wee bit, but but the Aksar Patel wicket on the final day where he looped it just mm. enough. Aksar's a really good player of spin. And he just wasn't quite there for the pitch, sort of skewed one back to, to Hartley, caught and bowled. That showed that, and then obviously the, the Barrett ball, of course, but it showed that he was prepared to, to play around with his, with his lengths and his lines and, his, and crucially his pace as well. Uh, and then you start to look at him and then you realise as you say, he can bat and he can feel. And then you start to wonder what kind of cricketer he could be for mm. England outside of these conditions. Mm. Well, I guess the huge, huge test for him next test is how, how he goes if conditions are a bit flatter in the first innings again. Um, Jack wrote in to say, uh, it's a great email. My question is, another astonishing comeback got me thinking. Has any team ever exploited the second innings of test matches the way England do under Stokes and McCullum? I think it's the key to the team playing with no fear and having such inc- incredible clarity of thought. They've realised the first half of a test match does not define the result. This allows them to treat the first half of the match as a free hit by not caring about the consequences of losing wickets, conceding runs, because the consequences in the first half of the game are not terminal. This has seen them concede leads on many occasions, on often huge leads, but they don't care because when it comes down to it, they back themselves to chase anything and take 10 wickets. Playing with that mindset regularly scrambles other teams. They have no idea what target to set because England might chase anything or they can't construct their own chase because the consequences of attacking England uh, and losing wickets is, is losing the match. Yeah, team, okay. sorry, t- team, teams have only held their nerve against England three times in 18 tests against England playing like this. And the South Africa blowout was, is an anomaly in that. Um, it boils down to England basically saying, I dare you to play us at this game. And most teams are not daring slash not executing it if they try. Whatever Basball is, I think their grasp on the psychology of winning or losing helps get the best out of our players while simultaneously confounding oppositions. Um, thanks again for the daily pods throughout the series. I bet after day two, you thought, why are we doing this to ourselves? Correct. And by the end of day four, you had an emphatic answer. Long live Test Cricket. Well, I was going to say another email of superior insights <laughs> by another of our acutely smart listeners <laughs> if only we could we could reach that kind of level of clarity of thought yes i reckon for our next live show we just sit in the front row and just get <laughs> get the audience up that's a great <laughs> idea well that chaps in what was his name sorry jack jack brilliant stuff um absolutely bang on katia bob asks is stokes going to back rahan ahmed in these conditions uh, until he succeeds or his legs been ultimately just not that relevant in India, I uh, think I'd be my, I, I might be tem- tempted to take a look at Bashir or bring in Robinson or Anderson for control. H- how, how do you see England going in the second test match in terms of balancing that attack? I guess it kind of depends on Leach, right? Because if Leach can't play that next test match, you're going in with a spin attack. You play three spinners of Rahan, Bashir and Tom Hartley, where Rahan would be the senior spinner playing his third test match. <laughs> that's, just, you, that's just not going to happen, really. So... If Leach is fit, there's a conceivable way that England don't play him. But they like him. And when Stokes tends to like people, he tends to play them. And you can easily see that Rahan on his day is going to completely rip through a side. He can rip through India, you know, full strength on his day. At 19, those days aren't going to come out, come about regularly. But there's always that potential there for him to do it. And relying on Tom Hartley to do it again. Shah Bashir on debut having been, you know, Dubai, England, Hyderabad, Vizag. Um, and Leach with a slightly dodgy knee plus Joe Root, you'd kind of want as many in there as possible, right? Mm. Um, so I, I think they'll keep him on for Vizag and then kind of make a decision on him. Obviously, it, it was quite stark how much they couldn't rely on him to, to, to take the wickets on the final day and, and how difficult it was when there were limited runs on the board. Um, but you've also got to think about how England have treated young leg spinners in the past and giving him one game in India where he's not done particularly well, it doesn't seem very Stokes-like to then mm. drop him off the back of that, especially when England have gone and won the Test match. No, I, I, think, I think that's a fair point. I also thought on the final day, he didn't bowl as badly as people made out to be. He bowled a, a, le- he bowled a wrong one mm. that missed Barrett's off stump by about a millimetre. One millimetre um, to, to the right, and that's the wicket that we're talking about, not, um, I was about to say, Axel's wicket of Barrett, Tom Hartley's wicket of Barrett. Um, <laughs> uh, I... Mean, I- Ooh, I think I tend to agree with Katia just I think they might give him one more at least 
Uh, I think not having Jadeja in the middle order and ha- replacing with another right hander almost certainly in that. Um, yeah. Pad Patida. Patida, not Padita. Patida, the right hander. Obviously, Sarfraz, the big lad, he's a right hander as well. One of those two, if perhaps even both, might come in. So that helps the Rayan case. I think the other thing is that he batted really well in the second mm. innings. He looked good in the first, actually. Bumrah got him out twice, but he looked very comfortable against the turning ball. Uh, and he he offers a really good option for England at eight because he reminds me of like a sort of Russian doll Moeen Ali in that he comes <laughs> in at number seven or eight. And as, as long as there's not too much pressure on him, he can just get his hands through a few that are, that are under his eye line and he can change the tempo and the tenor of an innings. And mm. um, folks help set that set that 400 odd up, obviously in the slipstream of a masterpiece. But he really then took it on to another level and then Hartley was able to play with a mm. bit of freedom on the back of that. So I think I think that becomes very useful in that in that team, even if he doesn't bowl a, a huge yeah, number of overs. I, I, I agree with that, especially if, if Root is bowling that much um, and if conditions are similar-ish to what we've seen. It sort of makes sense. I often think, what does the opposition not want to see? Mm. And I think when they see Rahan and Hartley coming in at eight and nine, yeah. mm-hmm. forget their bowling. You're like, yeah. oh, bloody hell. Like, right. That's a long batting lineup. up And also, yeah. they're not just, they're very different to India's lower order. In the India's lower order, who are very, very good, bat very classically. Ahmed and Hartley are actually capable of batting in a very similar way to how England's top seven did. So they, just, they just keep coming at you. And, yeah. You know, we, we, we reference Hartley's county championship bowling numbers a lot, but he averaged nearly 40 with the bat in yeah. 2023. And that's, that was that must have been a very big part of why England picked him. I remember when uh, Ahmed came in and I think Ollie Pope was maybe on 160 or something. And, and, and I remember sort of thinking, I wonder if he'll just um, give him the strike mm. and... Obviously, because I'm rooted in the old way that you play the game, and I was thinking, oh, he's got to stay with Pope here, and Pope will get. And you know, I think he rocked back and smashed his second ball for four, and he mm. kept on coming. So there, he he definitely did, as Phil says, like that he's got something about him with the bat. He can yeah. get runs, he can get quick runs, and he's 19. He doesn't. He just looked so sort of carefree at the at the crease. He just plays spin very well. Yeah, you know, he goes back to it. He, I think you might be referring to the sort of back foot punch, yeah. second or third ball. Yeah. Right out the screws, and it's a hard shot to play at the best of times, especially when it's turning away from you. But you just look like in complete control. And as I say, Bumrah reverse swung past him a couple of times, nicked him off twice. But another day, Bumrah's not in the attack at that moment. And, you know, he, he has, I think that might swing it. But again, God knows, he might open the batting. <laughs> I also think the Stokes thing, as Catcher says, like he'll just he he's he's had an okay test match. He didn't he didn't win the game or do anything like mind blowing, but he had a great he had a what is it, his third test? Well, and he still gave yeah. a good account of himself. I don't think Stokes will 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 change him. I think it, you know, if Leach is injured, he might come out or they might drop wood, rotate wood and mm. bring Anderson or, or Robinson in. But I think Stokes very much with those young spinners, he'll he'll give them all another game. That's like third test match, like you said, next yeah. one in Visa. So he's technically one fifer from two test matches, and we're talking about dropping him. Yeah. I get Pakistan was a long time ago, different mm. sides. Don't different use conditions. the word drop anymore, Catch. Well, there you go, rotate, rotate, rotate yeah. rest and rotate. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're you're looking at dropping a 19 year old for taking one fiver in two test matches with the white ball in the West Indies, producing some absolute rippers in the West Indies. He's had one bad game, and now we're talking about dropping him. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of what we've done to to spinners of for the last yonks, you know, mm. so many years. It, doesn't kind of make sense to treat Rahan in that same kind of way. M- McCallum was enjoying himself this morning in, <laughs> or overnight in the interviews saying we might play him all, mate. Might not play a, a seamer at all. I think that might be a step too far. Uh, the other thing is, about... Sorry, is it? Like, I mean, like, Wood, Wood, Wood it, didn't bowl that much in that, in that death match. He, he didn't. He didn't. But he also had Sharma dropped at slip and there mm. was an echo of reverse swing. And at, at certain points... India are going to be up in games, yeah. obviously, and then you perhaps need to think outside the box. You might want to bang a few in, leg side fields, etc. Mm. The other thing about whether they play any, but if they do play one, then who the personnel should be, Wood's hardly bowled at all, right? So there's no bother in playing him this, this mm. next test match. You know, he's and not then there's actually, a bit of a gap between the second and And then there's and a third. big gap, yeah. Mm. Uh, a 10-day gap, whatever it is. So, so I think they might actually pick the same team mm. after all of that. Yeah, I, I, think, I think they might as well. Um, just on India, I mean, they'll have to have a few changes and we'll, we'll get Wiz and India, Adia Sharma 
on in a second to talk those through. Just looking at the, the venue at Vizag, so it's hosting just its third test match. England played there in 2016, South Africa in 2019, and both games followed similar patterns. Big, big first innings runs. And then in the fourth innings, the visitors lost with sub 200 totals. And to be honest, we've probably not talked about it enough because of how fun it was. Obviously, the toss played a pretty big role in England's win. Um, it, it helps bowl, bowling last in India. When Apparently, Mark Wood was just punching the air. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> not Genuinely, surprised. just running I'm around not, punching the air. I'm not surprised. <laughs> but the toss has played a big role in the two test matches at Vizag before um, in the 2019 South Africa Test Match, South Africa scored 400 in their first innings and still lost by 200 runs. Interestingly, on what we were just talking about, uh, Seam played relatively prominent roles in both games. Shami got a fifer against South Africa in the fourth innings in 2019, benefiting from some inconsistent bouts and Broad took a fourfer there in 2016 and you know Broad didn't have a particularly great record in Asia. Um, so that that is interesting, I think. Um, just before we go to Adia, a moan from me on this series. It is way too difficult for people in the UK who don't have TNT to watch this. Mm. Um, or even you, if you do have TNT, it's still, I, I still find it quite difficult to find. time? You know, well, <laughs> just to find the channel on my TV. I'm like, uh, you, you know, the det- detectress, you know, the guy can't work the TV when his missus goes <laughs> out. I'm like, what do you even do here? It's a complex I'd... manoeuvre involving three different machines. <laughs> <laughs> and it's 4am, so you can't go and wake anyone up and be yeah. like, oh, excuse me, how do, you wake the, how do you get TNT 2 on or whatever oh. it is? Th- this yeah. is you a very get... specific problem to, to Wallace, <laughs> who gets his TNT for free, by the way. That's another hey, story. come on. You, you can Nothing's get free you, in this world. Feel free to WhatsApp me if you've got any problems. Oh, okay. Tech support. support. Yeah, yeah. You'll come round. No, you're, you're right what you say, and, and it's a massive missed opportunity that there aren't some kind of, you know, bought for a song, 45 minute highlights on channel four at five o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock or channel five or whatever. It's a great shame because the timings of these games suit that kind of Mm. slot as well. They wouldn't have cost very much money to get some... And it's in the interest of all the broadcasters, right? Because people are more likely... TNT have got the rights for England-India games in India for the next five years. It is surely in their interest for people who don't currently have subscriptions to watch it because they have highlights that are available for anyone in the UK on their YouTube channel. They're not great. They're eight minutes long. Yeah. They didn't show a replay of the Stokes run out of Jadeja. No. And in highlights that short, you don't get across sort of the the, the rhythm of an inning such as Pope's. Yeah. Um, so there's no real way for people who don't have TNT sports to truly, truly um, get how good the cricket has been so far. I also quite um, like, just on the coverage, I quite like that, because they're going to go to a studio, right? In Sweden. In, in Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> Madness. Yeah. <laughs> in I mean, what, in a, in a, Alistair Cook in a sauna. The, the, the whole <laughs> series as well is not just for the first, uh, the second test. Yeah. But for the, the next four games, Why they is hold it? up. Tax reasons or something? What is because it? I think from what I gather, the studio is basically, studio time is booked in. It's already okay. booked in for yeah. football. You know, they've got this vast aircraft hangar. Four in the morning. Hangar. Well, it's it will be rolling on from the night before and so yeah, on. Yeah, but basically, yeah. I think the studios, because obviously all the, you know, the design stuff, they do this Champions League stuff there. So I think there's just no way that they can fit it all yeah. in. And I do enjoy it because you remember when Channel 4 got them last time around yeah. and they got the chairs wrong yeah. and they were just sort of too low. And then you could say like the work experience yeah. person was sent out to DHS. Oh, a word, by the way, from Matt Floyd. I was just about yes. to say. Right. Just about to say, you go. Good, good bloke. Very good uh, broadcaster. Uh, and he he sat through in a room, staring at a TV screen from half three in the morning for four days straight, and maintained didn't miss a beat. By the way, yeah, tough tough gig. Yeah, got no one to talk to, got no one to confide in. <laughs> got his <laughs> TV he, working by himself. Yeah, yeah, he did. So that, <laughs> yeah, excludes you straight away. And so it was an outstanding bit of performance. I, I, I thought he was, he was Floyd, genuine, I thought it was genuinely excellent um, to be able to sort of convey the narrative of the game yeah. by himself every two um, hours. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I thought, was, I thought it was brilliant. Um, anyway, here is Wisden India editor Adi Sharma on how the first test was viewed in India, and also on what we should expect from a couple of the new faces in their squad for Test number two. Adi, you were there for all four days at Hyderabad. Did you enjoy it? Absolutely. There was no dull session, really. Um, at the end of it, um, you know, being around a lot of reactions about India seemingly losing from a point where they should have won. 
but uh, England played so well. Mm. What are the views of England's approach in India? Um, it's the first time the Indian public would have seen England play in India since Stokes and McCullum uh, took their respective jobs for England. Obviously, it didn't start very well for England in the Test match, but the final two days were all England. Absolutely. I think there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of good reaction, a lot of respect for how Oli Pope played. And you, you can see why. Um, it's it's obviously one of the best knocks by an overseas player coming to India. That being against this sort of an attack, uh, you know, it makes it so much more special. Um, starting from the coach himself, Rahul Dravid was so effusive in his praise for for Pope. The general reaction has also been that um, he, he played so well. But beyond that, there have been some questions over Rohit Sharma's captaincy. Uh, there is a school of thought that he was defensive uh, at times, especially after Ben Fox got out, um, the kind of feels he had for Tom Hartley and Rehan Ahmed, um, you know, pretty defensive. Uh, that was a point where India could have, you know, really clawed back in, but they, they let them play and, uh, you know, Amass the kind of lead that can all, always be difficult to to chase in the fourth innings. Uh, so yeah, those are the two main thoughts from from the game. The third thing being the general discussion about how good India's batters are playing against spin. Uh, some of them aren't probably... Um, you know, there was a discussion where I think uh, in the press conference, Rahul Dravid was saying that, you know, some of them are still young, uh, getting adjusted, you know, they play a lot of white ball cricket. They don't have enough time to go back and play domestic cricket. Uh, but it's also sort of worrying, right? Because, you know, you don't have Virat Kohli. Uh, you've moved away from a stage where you played Pujara and, and Rahane. You would expect the next uh, next uh, set to really transition. And they have been playing for a while. So, yeah, obviously a few worrying signs and it makes it... Um, even more interesting, there's going to be a lot more to look forward to. Yeah, there's so much talk about what the pitches might be going into the series. And when conditions were perhaps at their most extreme on day four, where it was turning more sharply than it had been in the previous three days, there were periods where India didn't really look like they were going anywhere. So the pitches yeah. that India have sort of been bigging up as saying, you know, these pitches are acceptable, etc. It's almost in those conditions that the disparity between the two sides is, is greatest in England's favour because England have a very clear method. It might not work all the time, but they've got this method that works in the third innings. What did you make of how India approached the run chase? Because it started pretty well with Jayaswal and, and Rohit, but when Jayaswal went out, who, by the way, was um, much, much less aggressive towards Hartley and Leach in the second innings as he was in the first innings, and then Ayo, who was quite aggressive in the first innings, was very passive in the second. What do you make of India's approach in the run chase and generally how they approach batting when conditions are turning more than usual? Yeah, I agree. I think India was a bit defensive than they should have been. Um, if you see how England had scoring shots and sweeps and reverse sweeps, India didn't have an equivalent for that. And on these pitches, you can't always, uh, you know, keep plonking your front foot forward and keep defending the ball. There's got to be one that that troubles you. Um, I guess in that sense, there are certain, there are a few people who you would expect to to sort of increase the tempo. Someone like a Shreya Sayur who's known to kill spin, who's known to be aggressive against spin. He was um, in in his, he was, he was pretty slow. Um, Shubman Gill is known to be very fluent, but he has not cracked the test code yet. So that's also a bit of, that's also a big worry really. So players like them, they, they are someone who ideally should be, uh, you know, playing spin a lot more fluently, getting the, the tempo in. And that's what you need in such a chase, but that was really not there. Mm. And then the day after the Test match finished, there was a the news that K.O. Rahul and Ravindra Jadeja will both miss at least the second Test match in the series. Um, two really big blows. Jadeja is an almost impossible player to replace because he, he bats the top six, um, he, he bowls loads. Um, how do you think they'll go about replacing them? Because it's not straightforward. I guess with Rahul, a batter will come in. But with Jadeja, India could either go with replacing Jadeja, the batter, or Jadeja, the spinner. And you've also got the question mark over Siraj, who had a peripheral role at best in the first test. Yeah, it's pretty complicated. So I don't think it's where you swap one player for the other. There's going to be a lot of uh, mix and match. So let's start from the start. Rohit and Jaiswal are playing. At three, um, 
again there's discussion if gil keeps a spot if he doesn't keep a spot there is patidar coming in rajat patidar who was in the squad as a replacement for virat kohli um at four is going to be shreyas iyer at five potentially sarfaraz khan another debutant if india is playing gil at three then probably there's a toss up between patidar and sarfaraz khan then this is the interesting part where we figure out what the <laughs> the bowling attack is so the, obviously there's going to be bumrah if india play one seamer there's bumrah ashwin aksar is going to be there he was he was good in the first things obviously you need both ashwin and, and aksar as the all rounders when you don't have jadeja especially kuldeep should play i feel kuldeep should play uh, definitely as an attacking option against england the way they are batting uh that leaves you with one more spot if obviously bharat is the keeper the one more spot would probably be washington sundar if not washington sundar there is the option of having saurabh kumar now in a way washington sundar is replacing ravindra jadeja in the role that they have it is a step down because he's not really matching jadeja and he is clearly an inferior bowler in that sense when you match him with jadeja um saurav kumar um has been taking a lot of wickets in domestic cricket and he can bat as well so you know you've got these options in in play um but yeah so basically if if i would say choose my 11 would be uh you know rohit jaiswal uh probably patidar over gill although i am not really in favor of you know dropping gill just yet but maybe if patidar comes in then you got ayer at 4 <clears throat> sarfraz khan at 5 washington sundar uh, then you just you know based on the batting order there's bharat ashwin uh, aksar kuldeep and bumrah hmm um so you think kuldeep could be quite a big difference um because there are times when india looked short of ideas when england were properly on a roll do you think kuldeep could be um india's most potent weapon against england thing with kuldeep is obviously we have even though he's been around since 2017 18 we haven't seen a lot of him in red ball cricket uh but from what we have seen he has the ability to bowl those you know wicket taking deliveries you know gets sharp turn um, he is very very clever with his variations uh keeps the batters on their toes um that sort of an attacking option i feel uh, really makes a difference uh but yeah i definitely think kuldeep should play um and especially so obviously if you are going with just one seamer he really fits in as the third third spinner mm. um in your 11 you've got one or maybe two debutants in the in the top 5 tell us a little bit about patidar and safraz khan because it's two very interesting stories for slightly different reasons yeah so safraz khan obviously there's been quite a lot of discussion in india over the last 2 3 years so he's a guy who averages millions basically yeah it's come down to 70 right now it's come okay. down to 70 <laughs> <laughs> and that's so, after after scoring what like 300 runs in the last two games as well <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so uh yeah so both patidar and uh, sarfaz scored big against england lions when they were playing for india a the sarfaz story has been uh, sarfaz khan has been you know in media attention since he was just a little kid from breaking sachin tendulkar's harris shield record school record to you know playing the ipl at 17 getting that attention from virat kohli that uh, you know that respect in the rcb team that he's going to be a future star and then there was a bit of a, a lull where you did not know where his career was going he did really well uh, 2019 20 onwards in domestic cricket he's been scoring truckloads of runs and um, you know i think a thousand runs each in two seasons and then top scoring and um yeah massive amount of runs but somehow he was not able to break into the team yet and you can understand why the kind of batting wealth india has it can't be easy for anyone it sort of shows uh, uh what india has been playing with that someone like a sarfraz hasn't been able to break in but yeah this is probably his best chance to get an india cap um <clears throat> patidar again interesting player he um he does well um he's really good against both the new ball and um and you know against spin he uh plays at number 3 for india a uh 
for his domestic team madhya pradesh he plays a little lower 4 5 um he's the kind of batter who can sort of change the tempo uh through the session he has his attacking strokes he's solid but he's got those strokes uh nothing really unconventional but uh, he's got his scoring shots and drive square cuts and all so uh both are really interesting uh, you know uh, options for india uh, one thing about surfrise that has been in discussion has been that he's not really as comfortable probably against genuine pace and, and sharp bounce but that shouldn't be a problem here and both sort of have a tendency to be a little unconventional at times you know losing their wickets to, to rash strokes maybe but, but equally more... but potentially have what you were missing a little bit in that second exactly. innings you know looking at those scorecards against England Lions they both score their runs very quickly exactly so that sort of works to their benefit also you know if you back someone like them they can really turn the match around uh, Sarfras plays the sweep a lot. So, you know, that's also an interesting option to have. So, yeah, that's basically um, how it is for these two. And in terms of the third potential debutant in Saurabh Kumar, uh, he's, he's been a workhorse, you know, left-arm spinner. He's very old school. Uh, gives the ball flight. Uh, um, unending amounts of control. He'll make you force into a false stroke. Uh, he doesn't rely a lot of on, say, variations and everything. He's just a very, uh, you know, to the point bowler in a way. And he can bat. He's got two first class hundreds. He scored 77 against the Lions uh, recently. So, yeah, you've got balance in both, both the options. If you think of a, a batting option, if you want some batting depth, maybe Sundar over, or over Saurabh Kumar. Uh, but yeah, I think it's it's even that way. So it's going to be pretty interesting. Mm, yeah, it'll be fascinating to see how Indy line up. Adia, cheers for your time. Um, we'll, we'll catch up after the second test match. Uh, the other great test result on Sunday was obviously West Indies. Uh, Shamar Joseph's uh, in, inspiring West Indies to their first win over Australia in over 20 years. Jim, that that was almost. I know that was more fun than, than the England win. I confess, I I switched over and and watched um, a good chunk of that because I just thought. I mean, he was taking out the stumps as well, so it was great fun watching. Mm. Uh, and uh, his story is is just incredible, and and what it means, you know, when Brian Lara is crying in the commentary box, and you know, when he's you know given a shot in the arm to Test cricket, and yeah, he's. Uh, I did a little piece the week before on on. You know, he's from a town. I don't know if you covered this in the in the test match yeah, in the um, it, podcast. Yeah, but yeah he's, did a bit suddenly. Yeah, I mean that is it's one of the great sort of origin stories of, um, and I do like all that stuff of of players. Uh, the game is richer for um, players arriving from different areas, and you know, here's a guy from a really remote area with a, no cricketing pedigree whatsoever, who who's sort of um, come along and and taken it by the scruff of the neck and his and his yeah bowling people out and mm. playing with a broken toe and all this and and committing his allegiance to the to the format and Pat Cummins has given him his shirt it was all a big loving really wasn't it on a Sunday morning so um yeah I do confess I, I turned out I did manage to turn over to <laughs> TNT three or whatever it was to watch Australia West Indies at the end you just have to go up or down on your remote control well mine doesn't really have that yeah it's you know yeah um uh, Ben Gardner cried <laughs> did he yeah Cried. Was that was that a laughing to, to in response to that? <laughs> no, not quite. Not quite. Okay. Yeah, Gardner cried. Um, am, I, am I the only one who was left slightly cold by it? By I the mean, sounds of it, yeah. <laughs> call me dead inside and all that, but um, yeah, because it, it, it's such a warm, fuzzy moment that lasted all of ten minutes, and then I thought, oh, in, in a couple of years' time, another B tier West Indies side will be sent to Australia, and nothing will have really changed. Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, you, you are right, but I guess I I sort of blocked that thought away for <laughs> I still I still have really, you know. Okay. Yeah, look, I I hear I hear that I do, but the human story is so That's irresistible brilliant. for this period for this moment, and and you can't you cannot imagine how psychologically corrosive it must be to basically be told you're shit. Everywhere you go, everyone says, even if they say it politely, you're, you're rubbish. And in Australia, they're quite blunt about that. 
And that would have been their daily food, right? That's their currency. And to have to rock up every day knowing that all of all of the greats of the past think that of you and the fans of the here and now are at best ambivalent. And to then turn it around, I mean, 60 for five on day one as a human story, that is as good as the game could ever possibly be. And it is fleeting. And you're right to say what you said. And, and Jonathan Lou's written the inevitable piece today in The Guardian about that. Uh, and when we wake up with a sore head, the situation still remains mm. challenging, to say the least. Um, but there are tiny offshoots as well that have been revealed since this win because it's almost been, for punters like us, a bit of a video nasty. It's hard to actually watch it. But since it's come out, since we've seen this, you start to hear about the, the sterling work being done for not very much money, but done for, for passion and love and from a great place of knowledge as well. And, and the structure around the A-team is a lot more, more coherent now than it was in the past. There's a lot more money going into Guyanese cricket than there has been in the past as well, in particular in the interior of the country. So they, they can unearth more of these kinds of cricketers. And while it's not enough, and we're nowhere near getting to a point where we can be optimistic about Red Bull cricket in the West Indies. Nonetheless, I think there is more of a confrontation with it now than there has been in the past. Mm. Uh, but crucially, you need this moment to convince the whole culture, the whole, the whole world of West Indies cricket that it's worth fighting for, that it's truly worth fighting for. Because there's been a fatalism around it for so long, understandably so. But what this has done this week is it's given us pause. Mm. There's a sense of utter inevitability about it. Well, now, perhaps it's not all done. Perhaps there is something worth fighting for. Yeah, if I rephrase that slightly better. That wasn't direct yeah. to you. <laughs> if I rephrase all. it slightly better, obviously it's a brilliant story and it is amazing. And I'm obsessed with Shamar Joseph's story. It's absolutely fantastic. But I've found it hard to, to shake that kind of pessimism and fatalism that, that surrounds West Indies cricket for any meaningful length of time following following watching that final moment and following watching the turnaround. You know, it's great that um, a team would, that had seven debutants in the squad at the start. It's unbelievable how they managed to do it. Yeah. But for me, it hasn't managed to to penetrate as as much as I hoped it would have done when initially watching the, the last end result of it for as long as I would have liked it to before those old feelings of nothing's really going to change have come mm. back in, mm. if that mm. makes sense. I, th I think you're right. I think, I think a lot of people also, I think this feels like the year almost that people have got angry right. at, the, at, the, at the state of things. And I think this year, uh, why I think, why for me this, was, this, this result was uh, really important and I actually felt some optimism afterwards was because... West Indies are coming here in the summer and people are going to be pissed off about the state of things in a meaningful way. And it's, I'm more optimistic that things will change than I have been at any point in the last two or three years about the state of um, Test cricket in the small nations just because this was just a really well-timed reminder of how good Test cricket should be more regularly when these guys are given more of a chance to, to, to fall. From a purely cricketing point of view, if you've got a bowling attack of Joseph, Joseph Seals for the next 10 years. you got a chance against most teams mm -hmm. as, as long as you guys can get up to a total. Mm -hmm. But I think, I, I think watch this space over the next six months. Obviously, things are in a really bad position. Um, but I think there'll be energy on governing bodies like the ECB to be like, okay, you've said for a while you'd like to do more. West Indies are here. What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, and I think there's going to be pressure on uh, boards and specifically the ECB in a way that there's not been before. Absolutely. Yeah, it shows the product at its best. So th that's what it is. So they have something to point to and say, this is this is what this could be if you gave more of a shit and gave some more investment and rejig things, which are all c completely possible. Um, so yes, it was. that's why it provides a little bit of hope, it, which might dissipate when we see what happens. But in the in those few moments afterwards it's like well this is how this is how good this thing is there, um, there is one other smallish thing to say on this about the the crowd numbers and also by the way i saw the viewing figures were released by cricket australia they're through the roof over the last two test matches west indies cricket in australia retains a sort of allure as it does over here in england as it does around the world but 
these are two countries where we watch lots of test cricket, where we foreground it. Um, there was 30,000 in the Gabba on day one. Uh, and there was not far off on day two as well. This is for a team that has been ridiculed, written off. Mm. The test matches in England, now, okay, we'll sell out anyone. But the test matches in England for the West Indies, where even us lot, as nerds, have been a little bit, mm, it might be a low profile summer. Mm. They've all sold out. Can't get a ticket for love the money. I had an email from friends this morning saying, well, we can't get any for the West Indies tour. Um, uh, what's that, rather? So they retain the appeal. And they're also watchable. They're raw. They're wildly uneven, but they're still watchable. Mm. Uh, and so if they can kind of maintain that sort of uh, pull, then we can build on that. We can build on that. Don't ever give them a two-test series ever again anywhere, mm. but then that's a, that's a more macro mm. story. It goes right to the heart of it. Uh, but yeah, look, it's 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 just been a, a spectacular week for the game, really. Mm. Sunday will go down in legend as mm. perhaps the most, perhaps the greatest day of Test cricket, certainly mm. of, of the modern era, certainly of this century. Mm. Um, Shamar Joseph has since signed for a couple of T20 leagues. Uh, initially, for in the, <laughs> <laughs> ten minutes later, and, and initially in the ILT20, uh, and then the Pakistan Super League. He's already pulled out of the. ILT20 because of the same injury. And retired from Test Cricket. <laughs> no, 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 not yet. Uh, he's pulled out of the ILT20 because of that injury that, that was causing him problems on the final day. Don't have a problem with it. Doesn't in, doesn't overlap with any Test Cricket. Fair enough. Let let him... Uh, he's not, he bowls 90 miles per hour. Let, let's see how he does. You can do both. I think I think it's unhelpful for the, for the cause of Test Cricket um, asking the most talented players to not even think about trying to earn a living in, in the franchise stuff uh, because you can't, I don't think you can ignore um, what T20 cricket is doing for the game. Um, and, and it does, and it does a lot of good as well. Um, anyway, moving on. David asks, how do you feel about the ECB telling WPL contracted players that they need to choose between finishing the WPL or playing in the New Zealand series? Is this reasonable or is it a misreading of the importance of the WPL to the women's game? Um, Katia, what do you think? Because you actually spoke to one of the very few people this stance actually applies to. Yeah, I spoke to Danny Wyatt yesterday um, about it. We were talking about it earlier and we were just saying how how weird it was that England took such a publicly hard line approach on it um, when there could have been more behind the scenes kind of discussion. And when they announced their squad later this week, I don't think anyone would have found it weird if they said, right, XXX is playing WPL, therefore will only be, be available for the last three T20s or the last four T20s. Because um, really it should only affect one match at the most two of the five match series. And of the players who you would expect to be in that T20 squad, only we're saying like four of them are the ones that are picked up in the WPL. So Nat Superbrunt, Wyatt, Capsi, and the last... Cap did I say Capsi? I just said Capsi. Yeah. Um, and Bell, Bell, who, who's already pulled out. Mm. Um, and what what Wyatt said was that she, that the England squad will be announced next week, but she's looking forward to playing both the WPL and the New Zealand tour. So I guess there must have been some kind of compromise reached, but we'll find mm. out later in the week. But, it, you know, we've been seeing these, this conversation happening in the men's game for so long and it caused so much controversy for so long until people kind of realise we have to allow mm. these people to earn earn the money they want, play in the leagues they want, and it makes the game a richer place when we allow within as much as we can players to play franchise leagues. And I just hope it doesn't take the same amount of time in the women's game with franchise opportunities rapidly expanding to come to that conclusion and to find a workable solution. Because the way the pay structure works at the minute, you can't be asking players to turn down the sums of money that someone like Nat Silverbrunt is going to earn in the mm. WPL. You think of someone like Danny Wyatt, she's in her, in her 30s. How, how much longer has she got left to claim advantage of these deals? You know, someone like Alice Capsi, the way these salaries are rising, there's almost no limit to what she can earn in, in her career. But for these older players, there is a limit to the money they can earn in their careers. And, and to ask them to say no to that puts them in an unfair and very difficult position to choose between that. And we were also saying the T20 World Cup is, is later this year. 
would you not rather someone like Alice Capsi, who's who struggled a bit against spin on that India tour, was playing in a WPL final on similar conditions, uh, in similar conditions to what she's going to face in Bangladesh, assuming she's playing the T20 World Cup, than plays one extra T20 in New Zealand? 100%. Exactly. So it's just about compromise. And I I just think it was a story that didn't really need to happen. There didn't yeah, need uh, to be as much of a hard line approach to it. Looking, looking through the players case by case, so Bell and Knight have already pulled out. Knight, I understand, as captain. It's a slightly different... Yes position Nat Silverbron is on an extraordinary amount of money that the English game can't compete with Eccleston not quite the same but similar so for them it is a it it would be an enormous decision for them to to forego those those contracts Izzy Wong's not in the squad at the moment is in previous squads so that's 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 potentially not even a decision um Kate Cross as well wasn't in England's last T20 squad so you know, again, that's potentially not even a decision that has to be made. And then you're only left with Danny Wyatt and Alice Capsi. And, you know, it, it is a statement that, yeah, I feel like didn't really need to be made because they could have even had the same stance, but mm. but privately. And they also have been, they have been flexible, right? They, 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 they've they given them the opportunity to to play. Yeah. Um, it's not as if they're saying you can't go. They're not, they're not saying you, we're, we're not giving you an NOC. So I think England have been flexible it's just yeah I think I think it is a bit of a non-story also um, John Lewis is coaching UP Warriors yeah. <laughs> you know what if they're in the final is he you know what are yeah. they doing there so yeah I just don't think they maybe they did but it just feels like it wasn't sought through as much as it should have been before the announcement mm. came out um in Australia Australia women beat South Africa um in a three-match T20i series but South Africa did register their first ever T20i win over Australia in the second game and, and really could have won the third, failing to defend 163 in the final over. Uh, South Africa set 162, Cap scored 75 from number three, and then Beth Mooney hit 82 in the chase for Australia. Uh, Mooney hit 70-odd in the run chase in the opening game too, so an excellent series for her. Um, and big news from New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand have dropped pod favourite Henry Nichols for a home series. Nichols, remember, averages basically 50 at home and 20 away. And we joke that he only scored his runs when we were all asleep <laughs> in the UK. Um, and he's continuing to do that this year. He's averaging 78 in the Plunkett Shield. Um, what a disgrace. The rest um, is silence, yeah. Yeah, the rest is silence. <laughs> um, anyway, to finish the show, a reminder of the question up top. Uh, 21. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Before we go to the final question. Uh, yeah, um, two digital offerings for you, 99p each. Uh, the Night Watchman India special, Night Watchman is long form cricket writing, celebrating the history and unique culture of Indian cricket, this particular issue. 99p, you can order it, digital special, so it will go straight into your inbox. Uh, go to thenightwatchman.net and all the rest of it, but we'll put it in the show notes. And WCM as well, the magazine, uh, the greatest uh, cricket magazine in the history of the world, um, is available. The current issue is still available for another couple of weeks before the new one comes out. And it is our India special with an interview with Tom Hartley and various others in there as well. That is also available in digital form for 99p. Can't say much fairer than that, really. Um, Pocketmags.com, which is P-K-T mags dot com slash other things you'll we'll leave it in the it. we'll, leave, we'll it in the leave it in the bottom uh it's well worth doing though it will change your life in a very small way um and and so will the trivia question yes um, so 21 players have scored a thousand or more runs for england in a test cricket from number three um ollie pope averages 49.34 but he's only seventh we've had a few good number threes over the years who are the top six Go on. Who's going to go for that? Ian Bell? No. What? What does Root average at three? Uh, Root is really low down the list. So I was struck by how many good England number threes there have been over the years. So Root is uh, in 16th with an mm. average of pretty much exactly 40 from number three. I, I, I've got five names. You've got five, okay. But I can't work out. Well, I don't know how many are accurate, obviously, but I can't work mm. out the six. Shall I go? I mean, yeah. Well, obviously, Wally... Wally's in there. Yeah, Wally averaged 74. So is he top? He's second. No. Yeah. Trot. No. No. Okay, um, so I, Trot was one of mine, so he's gone. Is Gower in there? Gower is 0.07 runs ahead of Pope as we speak, so right. he's in there. Right. So you've okay. got two out of the six. 
I reckon Kenny Barrington's in there. Kenny Barrington is up top with an average of 77. Is he? At number three. But he wow. wouldn't have scored that many runs, right? Because he didn't really bat three. Uh, 2,600 runs. Lots from of runs. 27 tests. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of runs. I thought he was more of a four or five. but uh, Well, he sort of must have been for his average to drop. As much as it did, right? Yeah. He must yeah, have played okay. a lot of test matches elsewhere All to right, get it so, down. So I had Hammond, Trot wrong, Gower right, Barrington right, and Ted so, Dexter as well? T- f- yeah. So you got two more. So Dexter was right? Yeah. Okay, two more. Uh, Dexter averaged 51. Um, so you're looking for one guy who played between 38 and 54, um, and another who played between 51 and 69. 51 and 69, 51 and 69. Oh, I hate this when you put on the spot. I hate it, I hate it. She just... very did ask you about an hour ago, so. <laughs> oh, brutal, isn't she? <laughs> I, got, I got nothing more. I can't cool. do it on the spot. Uh, so Tom Graveney. Oh, Wavy Graveney, of course. And uh, Bill Edrich, average 51 at number three. Of course, from Compton batted four. To 54. Tom um, Graveney, apologies for I should have known that. Uh, just cut a couple of interesting bits from this. So, I think we, we must have mentioned this on, on the show before, but the England number three to bat most often at number three, uh, that record of 78 innings remains Mark Butcher. Yeah. No one has batted more for three than, than Butcher. What did, what did he average? He averaged 38.3. Not bad. At number three. At all. Um, yeah. Some good bowlers around then. I, I, think, I think the record he has is he has the highest average for an England number three at home this century. So he averaged 50 in home tests. Which I think is slightly more than Trot. Um, um, what, what else is good from there? A lot, a lot of really, really, a lot of players did really well there. You know, Vaughan, Vaughan averaged forty. Um, Stewart averaged forty-three. Balance averaged forty-six. Um, Peter May average average forty-two. Um, obviously, Trot. Nasser averaged forty for number three as well. Are we um, saying three is the easiest place to bat now with these stats? Wow. Well, um, Look, looks like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, that is that is it for today's show. Cheers, Cathy. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Jim. Uh, thanks for listening, folks. We'll be back for the first daily of the second test match uh, at Friday lunchtime.